Long ago, the world of anime was divided as warring factions battled endlessly in a fruitless cyclical struggle to determine which series was truly the greatest of the year. Battle bros, drama hoes, comedy fans with their Nietzsche Joes, all had their champions, but none could convince the others of their latest fave's obvious superiority. It seemed to all involved as though this senseless carnage would continue indefinitely. Until one year, a great hero appeared. Sakuga nerds of all stripes marveled at his impeccable fighting skills. Lovers of comedy laughed along with his goofy antics and mundane economic concerns. Those craving a good shonen smackdown got to enjoy a pitch-perfect escalation of action, while even those normally immune to the genre's childish charms were made to drop their guard by his guise of irony and get swept up in the hype despite themselves. Yusuke Murata gave the horny contingent of the fandom plenty to enjoy, while One's impeccable writing infused the hero's hilarious adventures with some genuinely touching drama. For one glorious moment, we otaku were all in accordance. One Punch Man was the anime of the year. However, a scant 12 episodes later, just as swiftly as he'd appeared, the hero vanished leaving the world eagerly hanging on rumors of his return. Years passed, many other great anime came and went, and eventually, with much fanfare, the fated day did arrive. But the hero was… changed somehow. Stiffer, sloppier, oddly shinier, and just kinda objectively worse all around. It became clear to the people that he was but a false messiah, and they gradually gave up hope that their world would ever see such a perfect blend of comedy and over-the-top action again. Unless they, you know, fixed the problems with the third season. But then, in summer the following year, a new hero appeared out of the blue, bearing all the incredible power and impeccable comedic timing we remembered of our old savior. The only thing different was his name. Yes. Okay, am I really saying that the Misfit at Demon King Academy is the undisputed anime of the year? No, not unless Decadence pulls a darling, ReZero falls flat on its face, and Beastars blips out of existence, taking dozens of shows from the last two seasons with it. But if One Punch Man Season 2 left you wanting for a hilariously one-sided Sakuga-laden slap-em-up that takes the piss out of an extremely overdone power fantasy formula, Misfit does for outcast magic school prodigies what that series did for shonen superheroes. Now, you may think, at first blush, that chuny light novel power fantasies are immune to this kind of spoof, that fights in series like Mahoka are already so comically imbalanced and the harems surrounding their heroes so personality devoid and pandering that any attempt to parody them would be indistinguishable from the real thing. And you may, in fact, be right. The misfit of Demon King Academy is different from One Punch Man in one important respect. It absolutely never breaks kayfabe. That mother of yours whose basement you live in, she swallows, so... <laughs> the music and direction present every too serious moment with absolute sincerity. There are no winks to the audience during its absurd action scenes to ensure everyone is in on the joke, if there is a joke at all. For all I know, this is just the product of a writer unironically taking the most self-indulgent trends in the light novel scene to their absolute logical extreme. But the series delivers big enough laughs consistently enough that I'm pretty sure the po face delivery is just part of the gag, similar to the unflinching seriousness that makes Kaguya-sama's Japanese narrator so funny. Let's not talk about that dub. Or the overly literal but not obviously ironic direction of Mayoiga. Pretty sure, but not entirely. It could very easily be that this man is simply supposed to come off as the ultimate badass when he says stuff like, Either way, I really appreciate that the show never lets on that it's a joke, if it is. Because what makes it so damn funny is the idea that a certain kind of nerd could just say that with a straight face and think it's the coolest thing ever. 
It's like an improv skit where they drag in that one guy from your anime club who won't stop talking about his Super Saiyan 11 DOC, and he doesn't even know he's doing improv, but they keep yes-anding his ideas until he's basketball spinning an entire castle on his finger, and actually that's only episode two and there's still a whole season's worth of escalation to go after that. <laughs> If you're one of those anime fans who likes to argue on the internet about who could beat up who in a fight, then you will be delighted to see that this show directly addresses the classic but what about Dio though question in episode four. In progressing their action, escapist power fantasies really have nowhere to go but up, and when you start with a main character who has a combat-ready king engine and uses powers of resurrection that surpass Shenron just for funsies, well, you're gonna shoot past the upper echelons of other series' fight concepts pretty fast. As was the case with One Punch Man, what really makes this vertical power curve work is the laid-back attitude of the series' hero. Though where Saitama trapped himself in a mire of existential boredom and depression, Anos worked through all that shit like two millennia ago and is now pretty comfortable with who he is and where he's at. He has a relaxed confidence, some might say unbridled arrogance about him, that never drops in fights, and when people around him are wrong, which is often, he will tell them exactly why and how they are wrong in the most lackadaisically condescending way possible, and then proceed to absolutely obliterate them if they happen to be wrong about something involving a fight that they are currently having with him. Which is right in line with how most light novel protagonists act, really, but there's no insecurity or pent-up rage underlying Anos's attitude. He's just right about everything, can't believe how wrong most other people are about everything, and will tell them so quite matter-of-factly. This is pretty funny when he's explaining obscure, convoluted lore about the series' hard magic system, like everyone else but him is a complete idiot for not knowing it, and utterly hysterical when he gets around to rebutting straight-up common sense. This pointless ego-stroking over the MC having memorized the series wiki makes for an effective genre spoof and a remarkably effective exposition delivery system on top of that. Anytime the series needs to elaborate on a plot element that it's introduced, it can just have another character assume something about it and then have Anos lean in with an, um, actually. Thus far, we've established that Anos exponentially outclasses all of the foolish fools around him in terms of both combat skill and intellect, but he wouldn't be a real Chuny light novel protagonist if he didn't also have an ever-growing circle of waifus surrounding him. And in keeping with Anos being the ultimate Chuny protag kun Chad, not only does he acquaint himself with a friendly, busty Kudere and flat, twin-tailed Sundere who are twins right as the story begins, but but he conquers the legendary Mount Sundere by the end of episode two. Well, okay, technically speaking, Sasha Necron hasn't confessed her feelings for him yet, and they're not likely to go around holding hands anytime soon. For you see... <laughs> I want to be her friend. Self-indulgent light novel writers have for years been pushing the limits of how hard and how early their waifus can start simping for Protag-kun without undermining their fundamental tsundere-ness. And again, Misfit has leapt forward to the logical endpoint of that wish-fulfilling trend. Misha Necron, the quieter, <clears throat> bigger sister, doesn't need to be quite so forward because she's basically entirely devoted to Anos from the word go. She's one of those anime girls who didn't have any friends growing up due to tragic circumstances and thus imprints on the first non-related male who says more than two words to her like some kind of puppy. But, you know, a puppy with huge anime titty. I don't want to come down on the Necron sisters too hard because they do play into their tropes well, particularly Sasha, whose haughty arrogance can match Anos pound for pound, and they are surprisingly well-realized characters both beyond and within those tropes. I don't want to spoil too much of the plot, but the show actually does a hell of a lot to explain why they are the way they are through their backstories, right down to Sasha's habit of pushing away the people she cares about most, 
particularly when she's emotionally flustered. And as the series explores these backstories, we get to see other dimensions of Anos' character as well. He's not just an outspoken, literally unflappable, badass know-it-all. He seems to take genuine interest in his friends and puts a lot of effort into helping them build themselves up to be the best demons they can be. Possibly because it's boring for him to be the best guy in the room at everything all the time, but also he is a genuinely nice guy, a real people person, or demon's demon deep down which makes him a very easy protagonist to root for despite his posturing. There's impressively naturalistic writing underpinning a lot of Misfits characters, actually, and it even extends to the explicitly designated comic relief. The series has a lot of fun with Anos' parents, who are just insanely doting and supportive, treating him like their special little man even though he could quite literally kill someone just by looking at them. This is made even funnier by the fact that Anos just sort of rolls with it as he is immune to all kinds of damage, including parental embarrassment. His attitude is just, yeah, I am that great, and you should say it. It's a very funny comedic dynamic, and nobody would complain if it was just that, but it actually makes complete sense why his characters would behave this way, because as we learn in another gag, he's canonically only like a month old. He is still very much their precious newborn baby boy who they see through rose-colored glasses as being perfect in every conceivable way, and it just so happens that they're objectively right about that. The fact that the antics of Anos' family and other more obvious gags are unironically funny, and the series portrays them as explicit comic relief through its music, direction, and animation, only further muddies the waters as to whether the action scenes and declarations of absurdity badassery that it does play straight are meant to be as ironically hilarious as they end up being. If that comedy is intentional, then surrounding it with more conventional comic relief is a pretty brilliant way of plausibly maintaining an impression of accidental hilarity around the fights, the lack of which often makes media that tries to be so bad it's good on purpose ring hollow. Director Shin Onuma previously worked on Baka and Test, Bofuri, and the surprisingly funny A Little Sister's All You Need, so I'm inclined to believe that he's got the comedic chops to come up with an idea like that, but then he he also directed Death March to a Parallel World Rhapsody, so who can say for sure? Either way, anyone trying to make an ironic cringe comedy parody in that vein should definitely be taking notes on this show. And that said, even as the series hits those high-low notes with impressive bombast, it also manages to just be so good it's good a lot of the time. Ridiculous or not, the fights look consistently impressive, with exciting animation, strong shot composition, and effects compositing that puts the vast majority of more serious light novel adaptations to shame. The music, whether funny or dramatic, is also pretty damn great across the board, though coming from Don Machi's Keiji Inai, that is to be expected. And it's not just the comedy and character writing that has unexpected depth behind it. The world building in Misfit can also be genuinely interesting in surprisingly subtle ways. Take creation magic, which allows demons to will whole ass castles into existence on the fly for the show's action scenes. This discipline is mainly used to spice up mock battles, but it can also be used to create these intricately detailed miniature magical models something Misha does as a hobby. How magic would be used for artistic self-expression is something very few fantasy stories, especially in the light novel space, really explore, and that small detail adds a lot of flavor and depth to both the world and to Misha's character. Still, for every time the series seriously expands upon its world, there's every chance that it'll swerve unexpectedly into the realm of the absurd again. Episode 5, for example, opens on a small dust-up between Anos and his teacher, a staunch royalist who is perpetually offended by the idea of a misfit claiming the Demon King's throne. So she has one of their equally bigoted classmates steal a staff that Anos and his harem recovered from his castle in the last episode's big exam, reducing what should have been a perfect score to a measly provisional 70 until the staff can be recovered. 
which, if she had her way, it never would be. Hot-headed Sasha argues against the obvious unfairness of this, and another classmate, in a white uniform indicating that she's not a pure-blooded demon, chimes in, saying that the lowered grade is a clear case of anti-hybrid discrimination. The teacher fires back, saying that the classroom is no place for this girl to be pushing her Unitarian ideology. Of course, there's no use playing a 3D chess maneuver like this against someone who's already made the fourth dimension his bitch, so Anos quickly yanks the staff out of the would-be thief's very soul and returns it to his teacher in the smuggest way possible. The incident itself doesn't matter much to the overall plot, but that exchange does plant the seed that there are political organizations working to change the demon world status quo, and that the self-righteous traditionalist assholes of the world see them as more of an irritant than a movement worthy of serious consideration. It's one of those small conversational details that instantly makes the world feel bigger than it was. But remember, the number one rule of this genre is that the world must revolve around the protagonist, so when we get to meet them shortly thereafter, it turns out that in the last few months they've transformed into basically an Anos Voldigod fan club. And again, it totally makes sense why that funny thing would happen from a narrative standpoint. It's clear that this dude who the royals have branded as a misfit is if not the real deal, at the very least on a whole other level from every other contender for the throne. It's only natural that they would elevate him as a symbolic figurehead for their movement. But also, their reactions to him are... a bit much. Now, it doesn't seem like most of this fan club will be able to attain true harem status, and I can't say I'm not just a little disappointed with that, considering the varied lineup of cuties that comprises it. You got a mousy nerd girl, a tough eye patch lady, even a rare, genuinely thick waifu with pink hair. Like, it's not exactly revolutionary, but in an industry that almost solely rates female body type diversity in terms of bust size, it's nice to see some real variety. Still, they do get their own collective hero moment at one point, and it's pretty great. I don't want to spoil it, but let's just say that they do that thing where they play the theme song at a moment of peak badassery, only way better. I laughed so hard I cried. The Unitarian organization as a whole, at least, does seem like it's more than just a gag. Their fangirling hasn't gotten in the way of their more serious ambitions, and they do have covert backing from powerful figures in the current ruling order who'd like to see the status quo change but can't challenge it themselves directly. Beneath the humor, there's some genuinely interesting political intrigue at play in their storyline. Intrigue that ties directly into some of the series' not-so-subtle social commentary. If you know anything about the demographic makeup of Japan, and specifically the experience of its growing population of half-Japanese or Hafu citizens, it's not exactly difficult to draw parallels between that and the way half-demon hybrids in Dilhade are treated as second-class citizens. Honestly, it's not the most nuanced or correct exploration of racism. Like, there's a bit where one character basically says, hey, I don't see social class, I just want a grill. And the leader of the Unitarians responds, that's what it means to really not discriminate. You're basically our ideal demon. But I guess the bar is pretty low in this world, and it is neat to see what I thought would be a completely brain-dead wish fulfillment series trying to say anything at all. And there is another interesting dimension to this allegory. Just as there are clear parallels between hybrids and hafus, the royalist demons who discriminate against them are pretty clearly meant to stand in for right-wing Japanese nationalists. Believe me, I'm as surprised as you guys are to find a parallel to Japan sinks here. And what's interesting about that comparison is that the entire ideology that forms the foundation of the royalist worldview, built around veneration of the false founding ancestor Avo Stilhevia, is a convenient lie. It's the big mystery that drives the series. Someone fucked with time itself and the memories of the demon ruling class to replace Anos Voldigode in the historical record. 
And that revised history has serious political ramifications, just as the historical revisionism pushed by Japan's far right, uncritically valorizing the samurai and denying war crimes like the Nanking Massacre, has helped to validate and advance their discriminatory, warmongering agenda in both the past and present day. That is some shockingly sophisticated social satire for an over-the-top action comedy, and it's in those elements that I think the comparison to One Punch Man rings the strongest. That series riffs heavily on the backstabbing and ladder climbing of Japanese corporate and government bureaucracy with its hero system, and it's really only through exploring the ways in which that system is broken that One Punch Man is able to create the long-term dramatic tension needed to give its story legs, since the fights obviously aren't going to do that on its own. Anos Voldigod may be able to throw an entire castle one-handed and beat up time, but even he's going to struggle to solve millennia of systemic discrimination and upend deeply ingrained cultural beliefs. Like, he fucking rewrote the rules of magic on his first day of class, and even that wasn't enough to convince his teacher that a hybrid could be a worthy demon king. This, like One Punch Man's broken bureaucracy, is a problem that can't just be punched away, or heart beaten to death, resurrected, killed again, resurrected again, killed again again, and so on and so forth until it eventually taps out, goes to get its older brother for help, then he gets his ass kicked too, and uh, this metaphor is getting way out of hand. When I first watched The Misfit of Demon King Academy, I rolled my eyes at what I thought was just a particularly well-produced example of the same old self-indulgent light novel rigmarole. Role. Then I got a little further in and discovered that it functioned as a funny send-up of the tired tropes of the genre, which made me want to keep watching, ironically enjoying the absurd excess of it all. The more I watch, though, the more I genuinely become a fan of the series' world, characters, and story. Because there is some really good stuff mixed in with the comedy, ironic and otherwise. I've basically ended up in the same place Yazzie did after she spent a few months watching only ironic TikToks. I'm still not quite sure what to make of this thing in front of me, but I do know that I like it a lot on a lot of different levels. One Punch Man can have me at once eagerly anticipating the next big anticlimactic laugh and unironically hanging on every tense word of dialogue between every combatant who's not Saitama, and sometimes even on his exchanges with the biggest of big bads. And while it hasn't quite reached the same heights as one's work, Misfit has managed to put me under that same strange spell. So I'm not making this comparison lightly. The Misfit of Demon King Academy isn't just like One Punch Man because its protagonist can destroy a whole continent with an errant fart. If you love that series, then I think you are gonna find a lot to love in this one too. If you want to give it a watch, you can do so over on today's sponsor, Crunchyroll, where you can also find hundreds upon hundreds of other great anime released in English the same day they air in Japan, including ReZero, The God of High School, and the recent reboot of Digimon Adventure. Crunchyroll is an anime streaming platform built by and for otaku, with a handy cue feature to help you keep track of where you are in every series you're watching, manga series you can read on your browser and mobile app, and community forums where you can discuss your favorite shows. On the subject of community, their big annual con, Crunchyroll Expo, is going virtual this year, from September 4th through the 6th, with industry guests who've worked on God of High School, Dr. Stone, So I'm a Spider, So What, Rent-A-Girlfriend, and more. And you can register for your free ticket through their site today to hear all those experts speak about their work, catch industry panels and hear the latest news about upcoming shows and English releases, and enjoy a ton of other fun stuff besides. But you don't have to wait to start having fun. If you sign up for a free trial of Crunchyroll Premium at crunchyroll.com basement, you can start watching Misfit, Rent-A-Girlfriend, and other great anime today. And since that trial lasts 14 days, it'll keep you busy right up till Crunchyroll Expo. If you've seen Misfit, let me know in the comments below how many and which other anime protagonists you think it would take to take down Anos Voldigode. And while you're down there, there's some buttons. You know what to do with them. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.